thank you, Father, that you have stirred revival. Praise the Lord. By your spirit, it shall come to pass, even as you have declared it. For these are the last days, Lord. And there is a great harvest, and we shall be participants in it. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for the souls that will be saved. Thank you for the lives that will be transformed. Thank you, Lord, for the miraculous that we will be able to witness. We give you praise for it right now, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing in each and every one of us, Lord. Individually. In ways that only we individually understand. You are a personal God. Your salvation is personal. And your Holy Spirit is personal. And Father, I just pray that each one of us will yield to that spirit, to the spirit, and be led and directed as you would have us so that we can be the complete body that you've designed us to be, so that each of us fill the position, the calling, the truth of who we are in Christ, that we might see the fullness of God in Christ raise up in his church, that his body would become mature, the fullness of God in Christ. In Jesus' name, everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Thanks. Tim, for opening as always. Thank you. Praise God. And, uh, thank you, Suzanne. Peter and Mike, and Mike, praise the Lord. Thank you all, glory to God. Thank all of you that are here. Thank all of you that are joining us on Facebook, on uh, live stream, internet, however you are getting this. Praise the Lord. We appreciate you being part of it and being with us. And we do, I haven't had a chance to talk to everybody about this, but I, I'll just mention it in passing. We're going to try to do some, a few things a little differently. We're going to do some rotating as far as music is concerned. We'll have live music sometimes. Sometimes we'll have the recorded like we had this morning. Just to kind of give everybody an opportunity to participate and give God an opportunity to minister in ways that we never know for sure how he wants to do it. And we're going to give him opportunities to do that. Same way with opening. Tim does a fantastic job, and I appreciate him so much. We're going to continue. Tim's going to continue to be here ministering, uh, opening, and and as well as uh, preaching when I'm not here at times. But we're also going to try to rotate some other people in. Uh, there are others, uh, Suzanne, but Jody, Tammy, other ones that God is trying to deal with them. And we want the voice of God from every direction, from every possible way that he can give it to us. And uh, so that's, that's what we're after. Uh, we want to be and, – and see, it's important because just like I just prayed, God's got a voice that sounds like mine – it sounds like Tim's, it sounds like Don's, it sounds like Jane's, it sounds like Suzanne's. His, it's unique to each one of us. And so we need the entire body in order for us to get everything that God wants to give us. And uh, so that's, what, that's the desire. That's, the, that's what we want in order for God to have freedom, for the Holy Spirit to be able to minister in the ways that only he can. Praise the Lord. All right, praise God. Thanks again, all of you, for being here. And uh, God bless you, those that are online. We appreciate you participating as well. And so let's go to uh, John chapter 14. And I want to read verses 15 through 18. And I love how God speaks to us. I caught a little bit of uh, Suzanne's uh, stuff on, on the Internet yesterday. Sally had it, was pulling it up, so I got to watch uh, some of it. And it just... Immediately, she's talking about revival, and I'm thinking, okay, that's what God's been dealing with me about all week, and that's the message for today. And isn't God good, and isn't his spirit unique in that it always witnesses with himself, you know, his spirit with our spirit. And uh, so it's always, it's always great to have that. Tim 
spoke a few things this morning as well as he always does that resonate with what the Spirit is speaking to me as well. So uh, that's why we need one another, amen, to make those confirmations and affirmations of what God is doing and saying to each of us, amen. So if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Exodus chapter 31. I will not leave you comforters. I will come to you. Exodus 31 and verse 18. Praise God. He gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Praise the Lord. And I'm going to get into some stuff here in a minute, but I just want to set this up a little bit here. The children of Israel received the Ten Commandments on Pentecost. Uh, In Hebrew, it's called Shabbat, but it's, it's the same. It's the 50, 50 days after uh, Passover. So uh, the Ten Commandments are the foundation for the entire Torah. So all the first five books of the, of the law, they, they represent all of that. They are the kind of the synopsis of everything that God's going to get into as far as the law is concerned. Because if you go into Leviticus, you'll see all of the, all of the law, the, the dietary, the, the clothing, the cleanly, the, all of everything, everything that God's dealing with, the, the sacrifices and so on and so forth. And, and, and then again, in Numbers, he talks about some of that as well. But this entire Torah is the, the Ten Commandments, you could even say, and we know that because we see it on, or at least we used to, on our state buildings and federal buildings and courthouses and so on and so forth. And they represent historically the moral foundation for Jews and Christians everywhere. Actually, uh, for the most part uh, uh, of Western civilization, they represent our, our worldview, the way that we look at things, the way we deal with life in general, amen? And since details matter to God, there has to be some significance for the Ten Commandments. Why didn't he give 11? Why wasn't it eight? Why wasn't it four, five, 12, 15, whatever? There's a reason for there being Ten Commandments and for those Ten Commandments to be given on Sukkot or, or on Pentecost, as we call it. And here's some facts on the number 10. I love doing this because it gives me some time to just mess around with stuff besides everything else. Praise the Lord. But the words God said, they occur 10 times in the first chapter of Genesis. And I'll let you look them up for yourself, but it's Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 3, verse 6, verse 9, verse 11, verse 14, verse 20, verse 24, verse 26, verse 28, and verse 29. 10 times God said. Amen. By those ten utterances or or speakings of God, the world, the universe, was spoken into existence. Ten's also the number of of the generations between Adam and Noah, and ten generations between Noah and Abraham. Amen. And so between creation and the renewed creation after the flood, there's 10 generations. And then another 10 ger- generations from that, from that new creation after the flood to Abraham, who is the father of the creation of Israel or the Jews, amen? So God's got a, he's, he doesn't do stuff randomly, even though it looks that way sometimes in the way that we look at scripture. He's got a purpose in everything that he's doing, amen? And there's others I could go into, like the ten plagues. It's, it's the undoing of, of something that God had done. Uh, but for the time's sake, I'm just going to keep moving on here. God's word is also the code, obviously, for natural creation, but also for spiritual creation. Praise the Lord. And so when it's broken, there's an undoing, like you saw we could go back to, to Egypt, and I'm not going to, but that's what happens there. The code is broken, or the, 
the words that God spoke are undone or not followed. And what's the result? Chaos. An undoing of what God had done or what God wanted to, to be accomplished. Amen. And the end result is the system crashes. Whatever it was that was put into place falls apart. It's no different than blessings and cursings when he says, out of your mouth comes blessings and cursings, life and death, right? So uh, we say it like this. The Ten Commandments are like ten steps to spiritual freedom. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, in Hebrew, in the, the way it says it in the Hebrew Scripture is the ten statements. It doesn't call them commandments. It calls them statements or things that God spoke. Amen? So God's words, in other words, the ten things that God said to Moses. All right? So the first commandment is love God. Jesus said the greatest commandment when the guy asked him, he says, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Just what Suzanne was just talking about. It's love. Love is the number one thing that God is dealing with. First thing out of his mouth Amen. When he gives Moses his law, is love. All right? And so uh, what did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. And something else interesting, he says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We're still talking about Pentecost. Praise the Lord. So 50 days after Passover is this Shabbat. Or, or Pentecost, when God speaks, when God creates. And what is he creating? Opportunity for spiritual freedom, for spiritual creation. Praise the Lord. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 15 and 16. I mean kind of like what I was talking about with Afghanistan. When I'm saying that God creates this opportunity for spiritual freedom or spiritual creation, you can say, well, he created the earth for man. But why did he create man? Because he wanted fellowship, not with a body, with the spirit, because God's a spirit. But he had to have a place for man to dwell. So we can look at this as all about the natural, but in fact, it's not about the natural at all. It's about the spirit. He went, he went through all of 6,000 years, or 4,000 years anyway, to get to the place to where he could create a spirit again, to where the spirit of man could once again dwell and, and cooperate and function in agreement with God, in fellowship with God. It wasn't God just wanted some man to hold his hand and to walk along with him. He wanted this spiritual connection. So just like, let me just say this and we'll move on. But just like God said and there was light, God said and there was this, and God said and there was this tangible, physical creation. He's setting this all up so that God can speak again and bring a spiritual truth to that creation. Give it a reason for existence other than just the beauty of it, other than just the physical aspects of it. Same thing he did with man. He, he made a body, and the body wasn't sufficient, so he breathed the spirit into it because that's what he was after. The body was just a vehicle for that spirit to opera operate in, just like this earth. Everything in the earth, it, it declares the glory of God. Everything here is spiritual, even though we're seeing it as a natural thing. So God's creating physical things for a spiritual purpose. He, in other words, he made a physical creation so that he could have a spiritual creation. Praise the Lord. And God's not in a hurry like us. Because it's always now for him. And we're saying, well, why didn't he do it the next day? He had other things to do. 
And they all had to do with us, but I'm just saying. He operates in his time, which is timeless. Amen. So Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15 and 16 says, And you shall count unto you from the morrow. Now, he's speaking of they're leaving Egypt. So that's what he's talking about. They've just come out of Egypt. And you shall count unto you. And he's talking to Moses, setting everything up for the law and the Torah and all this. And he says, for the morrow, after the Sabbath. That, the Sabbath. That Sabbath is Passover. Right? And so the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, and that got me, caught my attention. Suzanne's up here. She may not have even known she's doing it. But I'm seeing a wave offering. Hallelujah. I mean, that's that's the way it was done. And so, and you brought the sheep of the wave offering. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. And even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number 50 days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. That's Pentecost, or for them it was uh, Shavuot. And uh, so that's what, that's what we're talking about here. All right, look at Acts now, and we'll read uh, verse or chapter 1 and verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise. He's given them the same kind of instructions. He just isn't being as specific about it because they didn't need that specificity because he was going to, it was going to come, and then they'd know that was the day. So shall depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. All right, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were where they were supposed to be, where God ordained them to be. All right? Now, generally, Christians think of Pentecost as a New Testament celebration. We don't think about the Old Testament Shabbat. We don't think about it in connection with that for the most part. We think about it as the birth of the church. Amen? But Pentecost is a Jewish biblical event. And it was first celebrated 50 days after the death angel passed by the people in Egypt when they came out of Egypt. The Passover, the original Passover. Amen. And the truth is, we can't really appreciate the, the full spiritual and prophetic significance of what it's all about to us without understanding what it was in the first place, what the shadow or the type really was pointing to, amen? And, and so in order to understand what's going on in Pentecost in the book of Acts, we really need to understand its historical roots in the Old Testament because there's a deeper meaning of Jesus, a deeper meaning of the resurrection a deeper meaning of the ascension, as well as the gift of the Holy Ghost. And it's in Shavuot, or Pentecost, we call it, and the days that led up to that. Okay, look at Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4. When the Lord saw that, he turned aside. When the Lord saw that, he turned aside to see. He's talking about, this is Moses. He's out in the desert, in the mountain. Amen. And when the Lord saw that uh, Moses turned to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. And he said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. All right. Verse 10 through 12. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people of, out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. The first Pentecost was at Mount Sinai, and that was the same spot where Moses met God at the burning bush. He said, you're going to come back here where this revelation came, 
and that's where I'm going to meet with you next time. Amen? So Passover without Pentecost wouldn't have been complete because the focus of Passover is redemption. Amen? And the purpose of redemption is revelation. That's what he's showing us here. The purpose to redeem my people is to give them a revelation of their God because they'd lost that. They've been in they've been in bondage for 400 years. They're totally disconnected. And if I could say that's where we have been to a large degree. And I, I'm not saying God is the author of any of this any more than he was the author of what was happening in Egypt, but he sh- Sure enough, going to use it, amen, to get our attention, to get us reconnected, amen, with him spiritually. So it's not just going through the motions of rituals and just being obedient and trying to, you know, pray a little bit here and do some good stuff. And I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm as guilty as everybody else is. I'm just saying this, there's a wake-up call going on here, and it's for the church first. We, we're not going to be able to do sick them for anybody else unless we're on board unless we know what it is we're, we're, we're offering. Amen? So the purpose of redemption is revelation. Now, we've all had revelation, various revelation, and it's all good. But the problem is, without everything that revelation brings, we can end up right back in bondage again. To have revela- to have knowledge, in other words, to have revelation and know something doesn't do us a bit of good unless we're operating in that revelation. Because we can end up right back in the mess we were in before. Look at Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10 and 11. For as the rain comes down, the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and make it go, bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Luke 4, verse 4. And what I'm saying, I guess, is this that we have to be serious now. We can't just do it when we need to do it. We need to be doing it all the time, whether we know that we need it or not. In other words, we've got to become habitual about the way we use the Word of God, the way we use our faith, the way we operate in life. It can't be just when I'm in a crisis, now I'm going to do it. That's part of what's going on here. God is using what the devil and idiot people have manipulated things to create. I don't even know. I, I'm, I've, I've become so paranoid that now I'm not even sure if what's going on in Afghanistan isn't just to keep our attention off of the election. And if COVID wasn't for the same purpose, to distract us from some other thing that somebody's wanting to do. And it's all the devil. He's a liar. And we've got a babbling idiot. I mean, sorry, but it's the fact. I mean, all you got to do is watch one news conference. You know this guy ain't right. I'm sorry. It's just the truth. And so there's stuff going on here that we need to be aware of. And, and and I'm not trying to get political, although how do you not be political when we're living in, a, in a, this mess that we're in? I'm not apologizing for it. I'm just saying we need to wake up and realize who our king is, and it sure ain't in Washington, D.C., amen, and that's, who's need to, that's where we need to be making our decisions based on that because I don't trust any of the rest of them. I don't care who they are or which side they're on. Call me paranoid if you want, but it's not paranoia if you know they're out to get you. Praise the Lord. So I'm just saying, I'm not going along with anything unless I'm feeling the Lord's unction in this. Amen. And if I make my mistakes, it'll be my mistake in hearing from God, not my mistake of just 
blindly obeying every idiocy that comes out of Washington or anywhere else for that matter. And I believe it's God. I believe that God is trying to get us back to the place where we are one nation under God, where it is in God that we trust, and God bless America, and America is not Washington, D.C. America is sitting right here in front of me. Praise the Lord. Anytime you can laugh at 13 dead American soldiers... There's something sick about you. There's something about you that needs some serious attention. And I'd like to be the one to administer every once in a while. Praise the Lord. Just, it just, it just, uh, it's beyond the pale. Praise the Lord. Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Amen. John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God, right? All right. Verse 12 and through 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? We beheld His glory. As many as received Him, to Him gave you power to become the sons of God. As many as received what? The Word. What did he give on, Pente on, the, on the original Pentecost? The Word. The Word came. Statement. God made statements to Moses. So the Word came. And it came by the Spirit. God is the Spirit. Amen? As many as uh, he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Praise the Lord. Physical freedom doesn't mean you're spiritually or emotionally free. And that's the real goal of redemption. Because they can lock us up. I've said this many times. We used to have this saying in the Marine Corps, they can, they can kill you, but they can't eat you. Well, the same mentality is they can lock you up, but they can't take away your soul. They can't take your thoughts. They can't capture who you are. They can crap, capture your physical being. They can lock that up, but they can't do anything about who I am. They don't have the ability. They don't have the capacity. I have to give that to them. Amen. And the real goal of redemption is for the spiritual freedom, for the emotional freedom, for the spiritual life to come. It isn't so much about the physical. That's what we saw in Egypt. They set the captives free. They got the, the physically out of Egypt. But that's just a type of what God's wanting to do, and that's to free us spiritually. So we're no longer bound to the God of this world. But we're free to serve our God, free to be one with our God. And if you look at what's going on here, we're seeing this. I'm telling you, we're seeing the same types all over again. Whether these morons know it or not, the devil doesn't know anything new. He has to keep repeating the things that he's done in the past. So they want to lock you down. They want to put a mask on you. They want to hide who you are. They want to separate you from other believers. I'm, I don't know if they have any intent in their own natural minds of doing this, but I'm telling you, that's what's happening whether they intended it or not. There's still just two things at work here, God and the devil. And when you've got a government that doesn't bow its knee to God and to the word of God and to the authority of God, then you've got a devil running your country. I don't care what you call it. Praise the Lord. And you can have a, a guy that's not real bright or maybe he's a little kind of rubs you the wrong way and can be a jerk. Hey, there's, there's yahoos all through the Bible and God used them because they were bold, because they were a little bit outside the box, but they do what God told them to do. 
So I'm not worried about personalities. I'm worried about who's going to do what they say they're going to do. And if they're going to stand for the word of God and for Christianity, then I'm all for them. Now, I could care less about the personality. What has been will be. And we're coming out of that bondage and deception and spiritual prison. God's woke in us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And it hasn't made me want any of you guys. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hasn't confused my stuff any. Praise the Lord. I'm just saying, we are redeemed. We are set free. We have been absolved. We are guiltless and saved. And so what do we got? Ah, you are a terrible person because you won't wear a mask all the time. Or you're a jerk because you got a shot. You're a jerk because you didn't get a shot. What? Everything is about dividing us. Everything is about creating us to be angry at one another. Everything is about trying to get us to make somebody else feel guilty because they made a decision based on their life and their purposes and their reasons and their needs. And we ought to just say, praise the Lord, they heard from God for themselves and thank God for that. Whether you got it or didn't get it, whether you want to wear one or you don't want to wear one, that ought to be your right as a uh, a, a citizen of humanity, of a, a child of God, and for crying out loud for an American. And it's gotten to the point now where I feel like that 16-year-old kid again that just whatever they're saying no to, I'm going to do it. <laughs> right? i got to prove I am somebody. I, I'm, a, I'm an adult now. I'm a grown-up. So you can't, don't tell me don't do that. Because I promise you, you'll be catching me tomorrow doing it. I know that's immature, but sometimes I think we just need to slap the boss in the face and just say, ah, that's enough. You know, if you stay in your territory, I'll stay in mine. When I'm working for you, I'll do what you tell me to do. But outside of that, I'm, I've got one boss, and that's God himself. You stay out of my personal stuff. You stay out of my family, out of my children and my grandchildren. You focus on taking care of the roads. Amen, and, and, and keeping the lights working and all that kind of stuff. And I'll worry about my own personal business, and, and I don't need your help. Praise the Lord. We are saved so that revelation can come. Revelation of who we are in God's plan. Revelation of who we are, and the purpose that God has for us so that it can be made known to us and understood by us, not just so we have information, but so that we know how it relates to us and how we're supposed to operate in it. Let's look at this. The revelation of, of the Lord at Mount Sinai to Israel, the Ten Commandments, God's Word, right? That happened 50 days after they escaped Egypt. So why did it take 50 days? Why didn't God just do it the next day? Biblically, here we go again, the number 50 represents freedom, jubilee. Debt's canceled. Slaves are set free. The land's returned to the family that owned it originally before they got into debt or before they had uh, poverty or whatever it was that caused them to have to give it up. All agricultural work came to a stop for a year. Nobody plowed the field, nobody planted the field, nobody worked the field, so the people and the land could rest. That's Leviticus 25. It's all written out there. Then it even goes so far as to say in Numbers 8:25, when a Levite reached the age of 50. He was released from his service in the temple or the tabernacle. That was all they were, that's all they existed for, was to be the priest that offered the sacrifices and did the work in the temple. When they reached 50, they were done. 
Go take a break for the rest of your life, however long that is. Amen? And it's interesting, too, that uh, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, mentions Exodus 50 times. The beginning of Israel's freedom. Jesus is our rest. The rest wherewith the weary shall find rest. Didn't he say, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden? I'll give you rest. I'm your jubilee. I'm your Pentecost. Jewish tradition. Exactly. And I'm getting there. Praise the Lord. The Jewish tradition teaches this. It teaches that there are 50 levels of spiritual impurity. And so in Egypt, Israel fell to the 49th level. They were right at rock bottom. They'd been there 400 years. I mean, they were cut off from God. They had no worship. They had no, no connection really with the Lord other than just memories and, and oral traditions that were passed on from father to son and so on and so forth. So they needed 50 days to purify and transform them spiritually and physically. They needed healing. They had centuries of abuse. They were slaves. They were beaten. They were, they were treated horribly. They needed to rebuild their relationship with God. They were physically broken by the abuse of their taskmasters, their slave masters. The hard work, the labor, all that went with it. And they were spiritually broken because all they had seen for 400 years was idolatry. Of every kind. They need multidimensional healing from hundreds of years of horror. And to think that could happen in 50 days is pretty incredible, actually, if you think about it. What they spent absorbing for hundreds of years, for generations and generations, and then in 50 days, God's able to say, that's it, we're done with it. Luke 1, 37. I'm just saying, here's, here's the analogy. We, we've got lifetimes filled with crap. The guy Suzanne was talking about. What was so horrible about his life? Only he and God knows. But something was keeping him from being able to accept a free gift from God. Redemption. A clean slate. Better than that, as though nothing had ever happened. We've all carried baggage into this thing with God. We get delivered and we need cleansing. We need rest. We need deliverance. We need to know that it's all good between us and God. No matter how much crap we've been carrying around for how long we've been carrying for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Praise the Lord. Proverbs 13, 12. I'm saying all of this stuff because this is, this is about us first. But it's also for the person you're going to have to talk to, the person you're going to have to reach out to, the person that comes to you and says, is there any truth to this? Can I believe this? What is it? How does it work? Will God forgive me? I'm worse than you were. Maybe. And maybe you just don't know me that well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, it's a tree of life. Hallelujah. So this picture of God's miraculous healing of Israel 
is the background for the healing that took place on the day of Pentecost and the healing that takes place every time someone receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit, every time someone is born again and receives the Spirit of God. It's all a picture, and each one of us experienced our own. There's a world out there that is dying, that's in slavery, that's in bondage, that is crying out the same way Israel did for God to send somebody to deliver them. You can be their Moses. You can be their Jesus. But you have to choose to do it. And most of us are standing out there by the burning bush saying, why me? I, I'm not good at this, Lord. I, 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 I struggle with one-on-ones. I don't know how to communicate it. And God is saying the same thing to you that he said to Moses. I'll be with you be with you. Didn't Jesus even say, in those last days when they drag you before the big shots, don't worry about it. Don't, you don't have to take notes. Don't worry about it. I'll give you something to say. And most of the time when we come into those encounters, it's been my experience that I'm stumbling around trying to think of some scripture or some, some way of trying to impress them with something that God did and I'll end up saying some stupid thing, and that makes more sense to them. It resonates with them more than anything else that I could have planned. Because they're hearing God, not me. Praise the Lord. Exodus 19 and verse 18. Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the, they were on a smoke break. They were on a smoke. Hallelujah. Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Flames came down in the upper room, and they point back to the Lord who descended in fire on Mount Sinai divided tongues. God was speaking. He spoke the Ten Commandments. He spoke the Ten Statements. Acts chapter 2, 2 through 4. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance, they began to speak with God's tongue. Praise the Lord. The difference on Mount Sinai, it was engraved in stone. Look at Jeremiah 31 verses 30 through 33. Jeremiah 31 verses 30 through 33. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity, every man that eateth the sour grapes of teeth. 31 through 33, please. Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt with my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. And those, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, not on stones, but in them, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Suko, Pentecost. Praise the Lord. So let's look again at Exodus 19 and verse 20. came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up, and God spoke. 
Those first tablets were broken, remember? Jesus, the rock of our salvation, was broken for us. But he rose again. showed up on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 in the person of the Holy Spirit Christ in you, the hope of glory hallelujah Genesis 1 verses 1 through 3 beginning God created the heaven and the earth the earth was without form and void the darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said let there be light and there was light so creation was the result of God's word and God's spirit and that's the same reason why the word and the spirit were both given on the day of Pentecost new creation, transformation. That's the result of the word and the spirit. John 4, 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What is truth? His word is the only truth that we know is absolute. Praise the Lord. Our interaction with God is identical to our creation in God. The way we relate to him is the same way. The earth, the same way the earth relates to God from creation. Our creation, we were created in Christ and we are to relate the same way our creation is to relate to God the same way and that's what he's talking about when he says we will worship him in spirit and in truth everything else we do is a is a uh, is an attempt to be in the spirit and to worship in spirit and in truth that's all we're doing you, you, you know you can make it any way you want to but the truth is all we're doing really is trying to get into the truth and worship in spirit to be in the spirit and in the truth is to worship God 2 Corinthians 5.17 every one of us as believers are a new creation amen therefore if any man be in Christ he's a new creature Old things are passed away. That it, was, it was without form and void. There was darkness on the deep. And God began to speak, and his spirit hovered. And what happened? There was a creation, a new creation. And that's exactly what happens to us. That's exactly what happened to us on Pentecost, our own personal, individual Pentecost. The spirit of God hovered over us, and God spoke. And we became a new creation in Christ. I'm telling you, folks, this is way deeper than we've ever understood it to be when we just get up there and say, you know, repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's way more than all of that. He, he designed an entire creation to give us a picture of what he was going to do for us individually. And we've made it all about this thing, and it's really always been about this. Talk about Suzanne talking about how much he loves us. We have no concept, I'm telling you. We cannot get our mind around it. Without the, without the Spirit, we'll never be able to understand it. It is so vast, it is so outrageous that he would go to the trouble and the expense and the time and the energy and all, uh, however human words you can use to say what God did to create this whole mess for one reason, so that he could make us a new creation. And if you think it's anything other than that, you're missing the boat. Praise God. Because it all culminates in this coming back to God.
back to before the foundation of the world, back before this physical thing ever existed in anybody's mind even. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There is nothing old about you. There is nothing, no baggage. There is no negative. There is no darkness. There is no failure. There is nothing in you but new creation. The perfection, if you can use natural ways of looking at it, the perfection of what this earth was when God first created it without any thorns, without any thistles, without insects, without anything ne negative at all. It was just perfect. It was Eden. It was paradise. That's you. That's me. And that's what God wants every person to be. But if we don't know it, how can we share it? If we don't know who we are, if we don't know what he's given us, how can we offer that to somebody else? We end up giving them religion. The last thing they need. You can get that in Washington. That's just another religion, folks. All we're seeing is, is idolatry and paganism and, and butchery and calling it women's rights. Now, I'm not picking on women. I'm just saying abortion is still what it's always been, Baal worship. It's still the, the mutilation and the des destruction of unborn children or babies, infants, to be sacrificed to the devil. They can say, I'm not saying they all know that. I, I suspect some of them probably do. But the average person does it. That's just, you know, my choice. Well, your choice, whether you know it or not, is to offer sacrifices to a devil and give him access into your life. And wonder why all hell goes on in your family and in your home and in you. God's forgive there's forgiveness for all of it. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, man, we and now they want us to pay for it. They want us to be participants. Don't you know that's what it's about? It isn't just because they need my money to do this. They want me to be involved. Praise God. I'm just getting off into everything, but I'm telling you, there's, there's so much going on here that has nothing to do with who we are and why we're here. This Holy Ghost experience is so radical that I don't think any of us, I know I don't, haven't been able to quite realize how outrageous this really is. What potential we have. I mean, I've seen some miracles. I've seen, and you, I've got to tell you, I just thought God showed up for a minute. And in every one of them, what God was trying to show me is that's what you do. not being egotistical. God knows I. the flesh is profits nothing. But I'm a new creature. I'm a whole new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I am Jesus in this earth. And unless I start functioning like him, he might as well not have ever come. To really understand what's happened to us, we need to understand the practice of anointing. In the Old Testament, only the priests, the kings, and some of the prophets were actually anointed, like Elisha, for example. They were anointed with special oil. Olive oil, we know it was blessed oil, right? Look at 1 Kings, for example, 1 Kings 19 and verse 16. Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, 
of Abelamoha shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. So what that signified was that they'd been appointed by God, chosen by God and appointed by God to these respective offices. Now look at what the Messiah, Christ in Greek, and it comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, and it means anointed one. Anointed for what? He's a prophet, he's the priest, and the king. And we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Look at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth not in the new millennium not in eternity now because in eternity we may be on some planet that's 10 billion light years from here that may be the planet we're governing we, have, we don't know all that stuff that God's doing but I got a pretty good idea I won't be living in Bondurant, Iowa. <laughs> Just saying. If it, hey, I'm fine if that's what it is. I'm just saying. He's got a whole plethora of things here that we have no concept of, that we don't know. We're just, this is the picture that he gives us here. Paul even said, look, y'all can prophesy. Now, you're all not going to be prophets. You're not all going to sit in the office of the prophet. But I would to God, you all prophesied. Because what is prophecy? It's saying what God says. We need to be prophesying. We need to be receiving from the prophets. And we need to be prophesying. Praise the Lord. This, that's, look, this is what makes the gift of the Holy Spirit so incredible. And we've, we've dumbed it down to just get into heaven. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. And they were, underline that, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Not some, not special ones, not ones that, you know, are acting more spiritual or whatever. I, and that's fine with me. You can act any way you want to. I'm just saying everybody was filled with the Holy Spirit. The difference was some of them knew it and some of them didn't. I'm telling you, that, that's been the history of the church. We looked at people, individuals that have prayed for the sick and they got healed, and we go, oh, my God, it's the second coming. No, it's just somebody that woke up to who they are in Christ. And we've elevated them to some stature that they never, that, that we all should have been at. You shall lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. We are followers of the Messiah, Jesus, the Lord's anointed one. That means you and I have been appointed and anointed by the Spirit of God with the power of God. It's, it's the truth. It's what the Bible teaches us. Look, look at Matthew 28 and verse 18. After Jesus' resurrection, what happened? All power. All. All power. There isn't any more power outside of him. All the power that there is, he has it. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. 
but you shall receive what? Power. After that, the Holy Ghost, after the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and the Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And what did he say? Go ye therefore, I've given you power, all power, I have all power, you're getting all power, now go into all the earth. And everywhere you go, take the word of God and the spirit of God and create. Are you listening to me? The word and the spirit hovered and moved and a creation took place. The word and the spirit came and new creations were created. And so what does Jesus say? I'm giving you all this power. And here's what I want you to do. Go recreate. I'm telling you, we're supposed to be creating new creatures, new, new worlds. Not supposed to be having a Bible study. There's nothing wrong with Bible studies. I'm just saying what we're supposed to be doing is creating new creations. Hallelujah. Just let that sink in for a minute. I mean, God, we've been given power and authority to transform the world, to literally make it an entirely different world, one creation at a time. The only real question is, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to keep doing it, just thinking that that's our ticket to heaven? My God, we don't need any of that in heaven. It's already a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus died as the Passover lamb, and he rose from the dead when? On first fruits. The feast of first fruits. And he did that to prove that we will rise too. That he was the first fruits. And we're going to rise as part of this end time harvest. And he poured out his spirit on Pentecost. So we will experience new creation transformation. <laughs> Listen. The anointing can change a world. The earth existed when God created the new, the recreation. It was just without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. We've been given this spirit this anointing, this Holy Spirit, and the Word of God to do the exact same thing that God did in the beginning. Because every one of these is a, is a beginning for somebody. And anointing, folks, to change You know, sometimes it's like algebra and trigonometry. You just have to go, yeah, okay. <laughs> I just, I just know it's true. I don't know. I'm not sure I can break this down for you. You know what I mean? But I know that's the answer because I did what I was supposed to do to get there. Let me. Just, okay, let's look, look at this. What's the last Hebrew holiday to have been fulfilled? Well, Suzanne says September is Jubilee. It's going to be a 50-year celebration for Israel. The last Hebrew holy day that has been fulfilled is Pentecost. The last one to be fulfilled. 
So if you want to know where we are in this age, and we're always talking about what time are we in, where are we, where, where are we in the scheme of all this, look at what took place in the Hebrew year after the Shabbat or the Pentecost. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 22. When you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of the field which thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and unto the stranger. I am the Lord your God. After Pentecost came the harvest. The Hebrews went out from Jerusalem, out to their fields, out to their vineyards, out to their to their wheat fields to their har- to the fields for this long summer harvest all summer they harvested they'd work through the summer months until they would return for the holy days in the fall so if pentecost was that last holy day to be fulfilled back then now is the summer of this age. Now is the time of the summer harvest. Just like Shabbat was the time of going out from Jerusalem, out to the fields, out to the harvest. That's what Jesus was talking about. Go out from Jerusalem. It was the very same 2,000 years ago. The apostles went out from Jerusalem to bring salvation to the world. And now the field is the world. The season is the age. And harvest is salvation. They're gathering in new life. They're creating a new world. John 4 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white already to harvest. In other words, he's saying it's summer. It's time to get to work. What did Jesus say about the present age? He said now was the time of harvest. The time to go out and reap. You know, the the Hebrew word for harvest is kayitz. And it also means the summer. Matthew 9, verse 37 and 38. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We're in the summer of the age. We're in the summer harvest. And that means our primary goal is to reap eternal life to spread the word of salvation to save the lost reap all you can in the time that you've got until we all appear in Jerusalem at the end of the summer there's a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven we're all going to be there at the end of this harvest back to the holy days back to the celebration Think about this. This is what the Lord laid this on me uh, a week or so ago, and I've been confessing it ever since. First time I thought of it, I thought, oh, my God, this is blasphemy. But it, that's what they said about Jesus. You know, they, every time he would do something that didn't fit their religious way of thinking, oh, he's a blasphemer. The devil made him do that. If our purpose, the purpose of our redemption was for revelation, Think about what Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, 
verse 18 and 19. And this has been my confession. This is what the Lord spoke to me. I woke up in the middle of the night about one night, and he was talking to me about keys and, and locks. I had this dream about all these really weird locks. They didn't look like normal, you know, like padlocks or key door locks. They just would look weird, just weird locks. And he said, you've got keys. You've got the keys. And then he spoke this to me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That is for every one of us, not just for me. It just became a revelation. I've been redeemed for this for this very kind of thing. Redeemed. We've been absolved. We've been found guiltless. Why? So that we can do this. So that we can have the courage and the boldness to do what Acts, what the book of Acts talks about, the disciples. You hear their threatenings, Lord. Give us boldness then to preach this word, to, to speak your word, to declare it in truth. And by stretching forth your hand to heal in the name of your holy child, Jesus. Show them. And the place where they were at was shaken. Just like on the day of Pentecost. Just like when Moses at the first Pentecost. I'll tell you, God has shaken us. He's trying to get our attention. That we are new creations. And our purpose, our sole purpose for being here is to recreate, to take the word and the spirit and create new creation for God. We need to get bolder. We need to get past ourselves, past our thinking, past our limitations, and just get stupid bold. Praise the Lord. And let God, let God worry about what we say and how we say it. Just do it. Just if, you, if you'll do it, I guarantee you, he'll give you something to say. Even if it sounds idiotic to you, it'll be the thing that needs to be said. The only thing that stops us is this. Afraid of being humiliated. Man, I've, I've, I've got to the corner of that. I had it for years. Praise the Lord. It didn't bother me to humiliate, make a fool out of myself. I thought I was cool. <laughs> Just shows you how stupid you can be at 20 or 30 or 40. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but we've got to get past it to satisfy our existence, our purpose for being. And God will honor it. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, you know, our world's out there to be conquered worlds to be created and only you can do it let's go let's do it in Jesus name let's have the trust let's just trust him and get stupid bold and every opportunity I don't care how small it is if you just think there's a hint that God might have been speaking step out and do it do it say something just reach out in some way God is good That's, that'll work that'll get something started even if it's a fist fight Praise the Lord. Amen. Just do it. Yes. In the name of Jesus, we just declare healing. She's delivered right now in the name of Jesus. The, the symptoms stop. And the, and the root cause is done. It's finished in Jesus' name. She is healed by the blood of Jesus in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for healing in the name of Jesus. Praise God. <laughs> glory to God. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. In Jesus' name, yes. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Glory to God. Just receive it. Praise God.
Praise God. <laughs> you don't know what to say, do you? Praise Because you don't know what I'm going to say. Yeah, sure. It's just, it's just a witness. It's that, fir it's that first step. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like what Tim was talking about with Nahum. Yes. Yes. Naaman. Mm -hmm. Right? He yeah. said, what, what? Why should I do that? It doesn't make sense. This is stupid. This is crazy. Just do what God yeah. said, yeah. and you'll see. The, he'll give you more to do if you need it, you know? And, and what's interesting about that, too, I preached a message years ago about this, but he... What he asked for when he left, he gave him a bunch of money and a bunch of gold and everything. And he said, well, all I want is two mules worth, two mule loads of earth from Israel. You know why? Because he said, when I go back, I got to go into this godless idolatry temple with my, with my leader. Because he demands that I be there, that he can lean on me while he goes in to worship these demon gods, little g. And he said, I'm, I've made up my mind after that. What I've experienced here, I know there's only one God. And I want to take dirt from Israel so that I can make a, an altar where I can worship my God, Amen. your God and my God, even in the land that I'm in. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I got, God is telling us, wherever we go, we see, we've got, the, we've got the, the temple with us. We've got the two mule loads of dirt. Wherever we are, we can offer sacrifices of praise and worship and we can see God and know that God will move even though just like Don just said that's what Naaman was saying that doesn't make sense I could have stayed where I was they had cleaner water over there it's about obedience it's about hearing the voice and responding to it it's about acting on that word by the spirit that's what's going to do it no matter how crazy it might sound to us God is looking he can do it in anything. He could, do, he could just wave his hand like, like Naaman wanted, but that isn't the way it works. He wants to see faith. He wants to see us operate in our identity and who we are, this new creation. He wants us recreating. And the only way we can do that is by the Word of God, what God says, right, and by the Spirit. He, he created healing. Right? I mean, you created a new creation. Jane was cancerous. And all of a sudden, she's pristine, pure, no cancer. A new creation. No chemo. Right? No, 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 no treatment. Just the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. I say just. That's all that you need. call them. Epsom salts, get in the bathtub. That'll be even better. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, everybody. Take the word. Just go with this. Amen. I know we're all witnessing this because we're all feeling, in a way it's weird because we're feeling separate, but yet we're feeling connected. And it's because we're hearing things and yet it doesn't quite fit and because God's talking to each one. Just like Don just said, God is talking to each one of us personally. This is personal. And I'm just trying to give you an overall view here. But God is talking to you. He'll talk to you individually and in how you need to do it. But you're going to do it the same way. You're going to do it by the Word and by the Spirit. And you're going to recreate and create new worlds, new creations. That's, you have to do it because that's why you're here. That's why he recreated you for this, that very purpose. Just be sensitive. Just, just be bold, to, even if it looks stupid, even if it doesn't make sense initially. He'll, he'll keep you on the right path. If you, if you miss it, he'll bump you back into where you need to be to get it done right. But you've got to have the courage to not be fearful. You're not going to blaspheme God. 
Not if you're trying to obey God. It's not blasphemy to, o- to try to obey God and miss it. Let's do it right now. Lord, right now, this is your daughter. And we just pray recreation, Lord. We, we, pray, we pray right now that the recreating power and anointing of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, that by your stripes she was healed. Hallelujah. She is a new creation, cancer-free right now, in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We rebuke every, every testimony of the doctors, every fact, and we replace it with the truth of God's Word. Hallelujah. That truth shall prevail, that she is healed by the stripes of Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord, for the testimony that will come. Thank you, Lord, for the healing. (laughs) Praise God. Glory to God. You are great God, a mighty God. Nothing is impossible with you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Hallelujah. Jesus' name. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for revival, Lord. Thank you for reviving us and spreading that revival from us to every person that we come into contact. I pray, Lord, that people will just feel the anointing, that they will actually feel the Holy Spirit when we are around them. Even like, like, like the disciples, when they would just pass them, their shadow would cause a healing, would create new things. Hallelujah. God, give us boldness. Give us confidence in who we are in you. Nothing shall be impossible if you can believe. Nothing. I mean, that's our God talking. Not wishful thinking. These are the facts of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We will. Hallelujah. We will. Be it unto us, Lord, even as you have spoken. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If anybody has anything they want to share, now's the time. You're welcome to. Hallelujah. If you're not, but go in the power of his might. That's who you are. That's what you are. Let your new creation create. Everywhere you go. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you, everybody online. Be blessed. All of you here, you're dismissed in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you. Have a great week in Jesus. Amen.